Welcome back to the Blue White Breakdown. My name is Bob Flounders. We're going to talk some Penn State football. Uh, I know that Kaiser is is close by as we record this on a Wednesday late morning, December thirteenth. You've got Boy. your SMU uh, t shirt on. You're always rocking the uh, the old school t shirts. I like that one. I forgot how much red was involved in the color scheme. But how are you? Um, I. Uh... I haven't fed Kaiser. That's why he's nearby. So if you want to just feed him real quick, I could talk for a good 60 seconds. If you <laughs> Do you want. remember the Chris Elliott gag on uh, the, the old late night where he, he did a taste test between new and old kennel ration and opened up the can? <laughs> he took like two minutes. You don't remember, up it, that you don't remember that? And he took, uh, took a giant spoonful. Of, I think he actually took, I mean, people have eaten dog food who are starving and yeah. he took a giant spoonful of this congealed and took a huge bite of it and then he he tried the new kennel ration and people are going oh I, and he's like yeah. and then he goes dave i can't tell any difference <laughs> dave i wanted you to know and maybe some penn state fans to know because it'll explain a lot about me my senior year at the university of scranton I had lived at an off, they didn't have, they didn't have fraternities or anything. It was too small of a school. So we lived in an off campus house. There was 13 of us in this house, but it was a big house. We lived there for a couple of years. We had a lot of parties there and halfway through the senior year, they condemned our house because of the parties, but they it's still actually let, like animal house. They still let it caught on fire. It was great. Uh, I, I, I lived on the third floor and the fire had a, put a hole in the roof. My landlord, my scummy landlord never fixed it. It was uh, you, so, wasn't it? It was you freebasing in the third floor. It was wasn't not. It? Uh, um, but yeah, so they let us live in it for the second part of the year, even though it was condemned. But you mentioned like uh, dog food. I never ate dog food, Dave, but my, one of my favorite things because we were on a tight budget was that Kraft macaroni in it. <laughs> that Kraft macaroni in the box. It's the like, cheesiest. It's like 99 cents. Yeah. And we were, you know, we were. That was that was that was the old ramen. That was the old that was the old ramen noodles of yeah. the day. Yeah. yeah, and we didn't have a ton of money. And late at night, if I was really hungry, and I looked in the fridge with thirteen guys, if there if there wasn't like any uh, milk, I would I, I could I would put chocolate milk uh, and mix chocolate milk in with a macaroni and cheese and eat it that way. It looked really bad, but it tasted really good. What? Yeah. It, I can't even. It's not that different. You know, I was in Atlanta, the la maybe the last time I was in Atlanta. Yeah. And a buddy of a buddy, a, a guy I don't really know that well, took me to a place where maybe I can find this place. I'll call him up. Yeah. Where they take bacon. They make their own bacon. Sure. Oh, then, that's certainly going to have your attention. And then they put ladles full of like natural oily peanut butter on a plate. Yes. Have oh, you ever done this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I would do it. Yeah. That's oh, and and you think what? And then you go, oh, yeah. oh, I think I, like, and so good for you, also. Yeah. Bob. Oh, it's you very good it. for you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a lot of healthy ingredients there. Dave, just tell the Penn State fans a little bit about your love for bacon, because we've uh, everyone that's kind of traveled with you on the road. It's love hate because I shouldn't buy it because I don't want to kill hogs. Uh, they're smart animals and. And yet it tastes so good. And yet you always get like triple orders of bacon. Well, Actually, it's a buffet and it's there and it doesn't cost 10 live anymore. I'm going to fuel up. It's better than eating that gruel in the press. Box. <laughs> it's usually Saturday morning. We could be at Purdue or something. Right. That's no, right. They never had a buffet at that place. Remember that place on the on the interstate? Oh, yeah. Interstate yeah. 65. That yeah, buffet. it was like a, a gas yeah. and go or something like that. <laughs> That was our hotel. <laughs> we had a room in the gas and go. I'm trying to imagine you being torn because it's you you love hogs, but then you like devour your body weight in bacon. Before. I can always rationalize, well, they've already killed them. You know. Uh, <laughs> all right. Let's, let's, yeah, I, it's true. It's all true. Let, let's uh let's get back. We we have a lot to get to. I didn't realize we got some uh we got some good info for you coming from you on Lane Kiffin and the Kiffin family, old miss head coach. But let's just talk a little bit about last time we chatted, Dave. Uh, Penn State's player movement is going to continue to happen at Penn State this month before the bowl game. Chop Robinson, 
You uh, never expected Chop to stick around, did you? No, that was no. that's not even. But yeah, I just wanted to talk more just about an appreciation maybe that you had for what, getting to watch him, and also even though I would say this, Dave, even though Penn State just just now is really ramping up their NIL program regarding the transfer portal, even they they've done a really good job being selectively adding players in the transfer portal the last three or four years. Chop Robinson's won. Johnny Dixon was a tremendous addition via the transfer portal. Hunter Norzad, transfer portal guy. Arnold Ebiketti, transfer portal guy. Ebiketti, Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they have been, they have been, when they target somebody and, and they get them to Penn State, invariably they have, they have developed their game significantly. And I think it's it's it is a tribute to the strength and conditioning program and James and his and his assistant coaches and the way they bring them along. But they've been very, very good in the transfer. They have resources that, let's face it, at school like Temple just does not have. And I'm also torn about this because I respect low and mid-major programs in basketball, um, G5s in football. And the fact that they will develop, they will recruit and develop a kid that they see something in, uh, like CHOP, and then they fly off to a a big Power 5 school like Penn State. And I hate that about it, about the transfer portal, because that is not going to stop. It's just going to continue. And that does suck. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, from from CHOP's standpoint, look, he never would have gotten the opportunities to show his wares to develop his body, to get primo coaching from a couple of really good coaches that he did at Penn State. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's under Rod Carey at Temple. It's a program going so nowhere. Chop was, at, Chop was at Maryland. and, and Oh, uh, that's, that's right. I, I was thinking, I'm, I'm, yeah, I know I'm you're talking thinking about of Eddie Petty because, yeah. Right. Um, sorry. I got, I, got, I got, but it's the same kind of situation. You know, Brian, Brian How Williams. How you say that about Mike Loxley's program? <laughs> I, They've been very competitive with Penn State the last two where, years. Where is Ebiketti, by the way? I, I lost track of he him. Was a, he's, a, he's with the Atlanta Falcons. He's he's had a good uh, year this year. Uh, second round pick to, in a couple a couple of drafts ago. But what a good player he was at Penn State. He was really good in one year. I was impressed. Yeah. And that was the first year that the portal became the portal, right? Yeah, really. It was, yeah, because he he joined them prior to the 2021 season. And that's because 2020 was a COVID year and you couldn't really, yeah. couldn't really do it. I mean, do you remember him at Temple? No. I had to look him up and I looked at his numbers. I'm like, hey, this guy looks like he's pretty good. He was like an all second team, all whatever t- league Temple's in. He was it's a second team all league. Yes. Yeah. But there yeah. you go. I mean, yeah. I, I start, I got two, I transposed two players, but it's the same thing. Yeah. It's actually more so with Ebiketti than yeah. it is with Chop because Ebiketti would never have had the opportunities that he did at mm-hmm. Penn State. And he, you saw right away yeah. uh, the potential. The game, that first game at Wisconsin. Yeah, I'm like, you were going, man, this uh, it was yeah, a close game. And what, game. He took it. They couldn't a, block him. It was a close game, and what he did mattered. And it He won was, the game, and so did Graham Mertz for Penn State. <laughs> By the way, have you seen Graham Mertz's uh, uh, numbers at Florida? Did you see to... the record they had this year? Five and seven. Yeah, but his numbers are great compared he's, to the He's the king of the checkdowns, man. And if in the red zone, he's a failure. <laughs> he's a complete failure. You're, you're, you're a Mertz mauler. You just won't <laughs> give him a break. Uh, I can't argue with that. Anyway, the, the, to, to your point about the – my point about the portal, it's yeah. great to see these guys get an opportunity. Um, yeah. And even in Chop's situation with Maryland, you know, he, he, he could have had the same opportunities there. Yeah. But he's following. He's ascending the ladder, even from Maryland to Penn State. And if he feels like this is the way he can really get better, then he should be able to do it. And he did, man. He yeah. did. Uh, who knows what happens to him at Maryland if he stays there? Doesn't yeah. always work that way, but it did this time. Two more transfer portal guys to talk to before we get to some uh, some Peach Bowl stuff and some Manny Diaz stuff. Um, Johnny Dixon and also, you know, a guy like Hunter Norzad to come from. I know he was really good at the Ivy League at Cornell, but to, to come to Penn State, play a meaningful role his first year at guard last year and be a second team all Big Ten center this year replacing Juice Scruggs. I mean, there were some there were some moments <clears throat> that 
you know, he, you know, he got beat, but when you're playing against Ohio state and Michigan, you're going to look bad once in a while, but the guy, it, it's hard to play center. And he was a great, I think considering where he came from, he might even be a, a better example of what Penn state can do for transfer portal guys than, than any of the other players. Cause that's really hard to make that jump. I think. Yeah. And that's always going to happen. It's always going to happen um, in a place from like Harvard to Penn state where you're going to find out what you can yeah. do. You Point might out. find out yep. what your ceiling is, but you also might find out how much better you can be. And yes. it was never going to happen for him at Harvard. I mean, come on. He's yeah, at yeah. Cornell. Or, uh, can I get one of these right? You know, you're, 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 re- you're just rounding into form. It's, it's, <laughs> it's you know, it's not. It's you're gonna, Ivy League. It's all you're, Ivy League. You, yeah. you peaked when you talked about bacon and how much you loved hogs. Oh, God. So you're going to bring it back with let's, the kids and stories you're going to tell. Let's just start over. Um, yeah. We're good. It's 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 Ivy any Ivy Ivy League school yep. up to that. You're not you're not going to find out what you can do, especially mm-hmm. there. He's got he's got nose tackles breathing down his neck, and mm-hmm. it's it's a hard position at this level. And he did struggle in he the did. middle of the season. I think all the interior line did, but by the end of the year, he was starting to round into shape and having better games. And yeah. I don't know, is he going to get a look in the NFL? Sure, I think so. I would also say this. And I, I hate to, I don't, other than outside of the Big Ten and a couple of SEC schools, I think a lot of conferences really don't care about playing, you know, good defense. And so uh, as an offensive lineman, you're not getting tested like you're getting tested in the Big Ten. Even like, even in the Illinois game, when you got to go against that Newton guy when they're moving him around, that's not a great Illinois team. That guy's going to be a first round pick. And he, he created, he caused havoc against Penn State. In that early that early season game out in Champaign, I just think the defensive play, the defensive line play in the Big Ten is is going to test you, uh, maybe better than at most other conferences. And you better be able to move your feet. Yeah, yeah. Against certain of these guys. Yeah. Johnny Johnny Newton did that all year too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Penn State played him early, but I'm watching. He was he might have been the best defensive lineman I saw against Penn State for the for the power pull. Let me tell you, there's no no one better than him in the SEC. Not yeah. this year. Sometimes, yeah. some years there is, there isn't this year. Yeah, uh, yeah. He's gonna be he's gonna be a terror. Can you and, imagine though know, going from going from playing in the Ivy League and you're seeing these monsters at different positions for the first time, and even going against the Penn State line in practice? You know, it's just it's it's a baptism by fire, and some people don't handle it, and other people get used to it and start to thrive. And I think Hunter did that. Yeah, and it took him a little time. I mean, yeah, I think Penn State's schedule helped him because it ramped up kind of gently. You got West Virginia to start, but then uh, he didn't really have to deal with Newton because yeah. he's inside. And you get Iowa in September. That yeah. that's a good yeah. defense. You can you can say what you want about the offense. That's a really good defense. Well, what do you make of? Um, the Mississippi Penn State matchup. I don't know if you've looked at it too much. I did. I did. Um, it, to me, you know, it, I know that Ole Miss scored all those points, but when they played two decent defenses, it, it their offense really couldn't do much uh, in the Alabama and Georgia games. And I, I know, I do know the running back is very, very, very good. Uh, the sophomore running back, I think, one of the best running backs in the country. I'm not sure what this what what this this court how good this quarterback is or how how into the game Lane Kiffin's actually going to be I would be surprised if Penn State didn't win this game I would well you never know who's going to show up in these games but and Penn I don't State mean it does they usually do Penn State, yeah, they, Penn State usually does they have but there's also been Kentucky's there's been yeah. Arkansas's where they haven't but I mean, um, under, under Franklin, you know, the 2021 Outback Bowl, they, all the, that was that was a different story because they lost like eight players before the game. If if the majority of the team plays in this game, I think I think oh, I think Old Miss is going to have their hands full. And what do you think about the way they call the defense uh, with Manny Diaz not there? Yeah, so I think it'll be. I'm almost positive it's going to be Poindexter because he's yeah. been in D.C. before. That's pretty obvious, but but will he be able to call it with the same savvy? It's that's, he's been, no, he's been that's, a D.C. That yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I'm sure he got a, a, an up close view of how Manny gets ready and preps and game plans. But 
I don't know that there's many better than Manny, and I, I'm sure it'll look a little bit different, but Poindexter has done a fantastic job as the safeties coach at Penn State. I know, I know coordinating the UConn defense and coordinating the Penn State defense for a game isn't the same thing, but when you have the athletes Penn State has, I mean, it does. I think it makes your job a lot easier, Dave. It really does. Well, there are people who think that this game will be that that the way Diaz's defenses work will be something like Texas A&M's defense. Uh, they've compared it to that. Um, they think that the 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 way that that and, and Lane Kiffin. It's funny. Lane Kiffin's kind of an offensive guru. Uh, he's always been an offensive coach, has he not? Yeah. yeah. And yet his dad Monty was a defensive guru. Sure thing. Guru who is responsible for the Tampa two, I think, or was that uh, Tony that Dungy? Was, or, I think or that whatever. was him and Lovey Smith together because okay. Lovey's a defensive coach too. I think that's right. Cause Lovey was there at that time, but I think Lane, I think Monty was there when Gruden won the Super Bowl for them. It was the O2 season, the O3 game against the Raiders, right? I only wonder what this would have been like with Lane Kiffin and Joe Paterno at the same pole. Game. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it, do you remember the bowl game where we had we had Spurrier and it was kind of an off year for Spurrier and, and Spurrier's such a smart ass he's kind of like a droll and and kind of a muted okay. sense of, yeah. Yeah. muted muted smart ass sense of humor that's Lane Kiffin and uh, he has a great sense of humor Monty had an incredible sense of humor from what I've heard mm -hmm. um, so there are a lot of like that way so he should be fun in some of the press conferences I mean he's He's kind of snarky and says some goofy stuff. But wasn't he mentioned for the Auburn job at, at when it when it was open? Lane. Lane. Yeah. yeah. I think I did I, I don't know how serious it got, but I think his name was associated with it for sure at the start. Yeah. Well, those people are crazy. Uh and <laughs> clearly they, they hired Brian Harson. So you know it's like a committee. <laughs> One of your favorites. One of your favorites. It's just not a fit. Why would they hire him? I know. I know. And and Lane has been all over the place. He was he was at Tennessee. Mm -hmm. He was at USC. Uh, one of the youngest head coaches ever. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of grown. Was he Raiders head coach when he was yeah, super? Yeah, young? I mean, really young. Yeah, Ridiculous. Yeah. Al Davis, another crazy man, uh, just <laughs> seated him in the job. It's like what? But he's you talk about trial by fire. The yeah. guy's had it. Yeah. And now he's, I, I guess, I didn't look it up, but do you think he's 40, 40 or something like that? Oh, he's a little bit older than that, but he's somewhere yeah. in his 40s probably. Yeah. Yeah. He's old, younger than you would think because he started so young. Yeah. Uh, 43, 44. But he's kind of, kind of worn into this job in a really good way. And I think he's in a perfect place in Mississippi because while everyone in the SEC is crazy about winning, this place – it's a lot better fit for him than if he'd gone to Auburn. He's getting paid. Um, it's a little different in that it's it's kind of a more refined atmosphere down there. The Grove, and uh, you know, when I quit, I'm gonna I'm gonna start doing college football road trips, and that and Mississippi is one place I want to go. Right? I want to go to Ox, Oxford, Oxford, Mississippi, oh, that's and, right. that's and Oxford, see that. California. See that. Are any of us going to get anything right in this podcast? <laughs> I had the first two letters right, so I'm going to take our <laughs> It's Oxnard, California. Yeah, I think the Cowboys might have traded there too. Yeah, and that is one place I would love to go. So they're going to bring the entire city up to Atlanta. I think they're pretty excited about it at 10-2. and two. Their 10-2 and two is more exciting for them. They never have had an 11-win season. Than Penn State's 10-2. and two. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually trying to get a hold of uh, trying to get a hold of Eli Manning to talk about the place, which I think would be yeah. fun. I'm working through ESPN. We'll see if that develops to talk about what a unique place it is, even in the SEC, uh, because they like they like their drinking down there, but they also have it at tailgates. Like they'll have candelabras. They'll have. They'll have fine, fine dining with white tablecloths in in the tailgating. They call it the Grove. There's a lot of trees. It's 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 different in a refined way. Refined drinking. I got it. Ref Ooh. I don't know anything about refined drinking, but I yeah. got. Oh, they drink. Yeah. So they have fun martinis and and 
and mixing in, in big bowls. And no one's they, drinking slits at the tail. They have a yeah, it's a it's a little bit different kind of tailgating than Dance. they they dress up and it's a different thing yes. than the rest of even the SEC. What I think is really going to be fun is imagine if this was a playoff game. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, imagine if it was next year. Yeah. And either Ole Miss is in state college oh, they or would hate Penn it. State in Oxford. Wouldn't it be great? Penn State fans would love that trip. Of course. It's yeah. going to be great. People, and, and that is seed number five to seed number 12. Those eight teams yeah. are going to play at home sites in, in the playoffs. And people can't. People aren't talking about it because they can't envision it yet. Yeah. But you're going to have Southern teams coming up north in, De- in December, freezing their asses off. That's <laughs> never happened before. I know. It's never happened before. The only place it's happened is, I guess, the, the, the pinstripe bowl. Yeah. Where, where, like, Duke would come up to New York City. That's it. But that's not like SEC teams yeah. coming up to a place like Beaver Stadium or – Penn State going down to a home game in Oxford, Mississippi. I mean, that is going to be terrific. It will be better than this in a domed, a big dome stadium. Dave, don't you think if he ever wanted to, considering his how his his coaching career has gone, Lane Kiffin could write a phenomenal book because oh, yeah. a chapter on Pat Hayden, a chapter on Nick Saban. Do you remember Pat Hayden? Hayden met him at the airport and told him to to, to don't even get on the team bus. Didn't, it wasn't that how he fired him after that I one. I forgot time. all about that, but you're right. Yeah, so yeah. he met him. He said, "Like you're no, you're good. You're gonna stay right here. You're not going back." I don't think. Fired yeah, him. There was there was a year back. where there was a year at Tennessee where no one talked about anything except his his like smoking hot wife. <laughs> you remember ex wife? Is it an yeah, now, now it's an ex wife. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. He could write a book. I would want to ghostwrite that book. Al Ooh. Davis, Pat Hayden, Tennessee. Nick Saban, that shouting match on the sideline, trying to trying to coach under him. And now he's got his own place. I think this is a really a happy place for him because yeah. there's not too much pressure. They're not going to flip out if they don't beat. Uh, mm-hmm. And now with no divisions in the SEC, they're going to have a shot at being pretty good all the time. And that's good enough for people at Ole Miss. Yeah. They, they want to win, but they're not used to big winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a this is a. This is a perfect place for him, and I don't think they have any illusions at Ole Miss about who they are or who they should be because they never won any – well, I guess they won the 1962 national title or something like that, right? They did. I'm not sure about that, but, yeah. I I just remember Eli Eli played at Ole Miss, and uh, our friend Ernie Acorsi Acorsi drafted him because he said he did did a great job because he didn't have any help, and he he kept him in, like, every game. Well, let me tell you, his dad, Archie, yeah. was one of the great college quarterbacks at all t- of all time, but yeah. they, never, they never sniffed anything regarding a national championship in 1970, 71, when, he, right. when Archie played. Um, they don't expect that much, unlike another 10-2 and two team in this bowl, mm-hmm. where th- only, there are... So I'm, pretty, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I got well, it. Well, this is what I'm saying. There are expectations of a couple of programs in this bowl, so I'm going to have to disagree with you about who I think is going to win this game, and we'll talk about that later. Uh-huh. Because I think Mississippi is happy to be there, and I don't think there's any discord. And I think there's quite a bit of discord in the Penn State situation among the fan base. Uh, they're, they're not happy with this game. I think Ole Miss is going to outdraw them two to one, don't you? Going to Atlanta? What is, yeah, figure that what is, what is that seat like eighty thousand? You're you're thinking it'll be like fifty thousand, oh, thirty thousand, or something. They're like that. They're excited. They're the Ole Miss people are excited about this game. It's a big time game. I mean, they've they've been in the Sugar Bowl a couple of years ago and they played Baylor, but that's not like playing a, a you know a bunch of Yankees. You know, they they they're into that. Um, <laughs> I think they played TCU in the Peach Bowl a few many years ago, but that was that was a prior regime. <laughs> um, they they like this team. It's a fun, exciting team, mm-hmm. and I think they're upbeat in a way that Penn State really is not. So whether that has an effect on the game, I don't know. But okay. we'll we'll talk about that later. We can get to that later. 
Hey, Dave, we got, let's, before we uh, wrap this baby up, I wanted to make sure I got this to, with you because uh, <clears throat> I, you put a lot of time in, and effort into it and I really care about it too, but the Heisman voting, how it played out, uh, we can discuss who we voted for, but do you feel like at the end that they got it right uh, with, with who won it? And uh, just your thoughts on, on the top three and, uh, and kind of how things played out this year. Well, look, I mean, we've all seen quarterbacks with crazy stats where you kind of know, well, okay, it's a system guy. I mean, yeah. Tim, Timmy Chang had crazy stats. Was, yeah. was he the best quarterback that year at Hawaii? Probably not. But, but the debt Merce. And I, yeah, I'm not, I think Jaden Daniels was just a terrific player, yeah. both as a runner and a passer. He played mm -hmm. with a crap defense. And I thought he just supported that program. I had no problem voting for him, number one. And I did. Um, Marvin Harrison was my number two. And were it not for Jaden Daniels, he would have been my number one. Um, I loved your number three pick, actually. I, and I'm in all sincerity, I thought you you. Did oh, we did talk about this, didn't we? Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I really yeah. liked your number three pick because I do think um, there's a lot of there were a lot of defensive coordinators that would love this guy and his impact as a you know on defense, but also on special teams. For you know, it really, really, I I don't know that I've seen just a winner, a better, a better <laughs> Iowa player. Uh, and for all the things he did, I really thought you you got a really good. He's like a Bobby Sanders level as far as a guy who's Dijon, right? Cooper DeGene. Dijon. Cooper DeGene. Yeah, yeah, just a Bobby Sanders level player as far as a guy who is. Oh my God, it's him again. Who guess who? You know the commentators always go guess who. Yeah, Cooper DeGene was everywhere, and then he was a special teams ace. Right, the right. incredible punt returner in an age where people don't really concentrate on punt returning. Fearless. Uh, Fearless. If he intercepted a pass, you were afraid it was going to be a pick six every time. Mm -hmm. uh, just uh, an, an incredible uh, runner after contact. Yeah. You wondered if shouldn't he be. I was yeah. talking to Scott Dockerman in the middle of the season. I was like, why don't they put him in a slot receiver and use him like Tim Dwight or even on the outside? I mean, they didn't have anybody. Mm -hmm. to, to to run with that offense, at least use him a few plays on offense because he could have done that. Cooper DeGene was just a terrific player. He got hurt, unfortunately. I can't remember if it was the Illinois game, week week 11, week half of the year, yeah. Yeah, Rutgers or Illinois they were playing. And that that probably would have hurt his – not that anyone was thinking about him about a Heisman ballot, but, but to me he was absolutely the defensive player of the year in the Big Ten. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know who won. Who did win? Do you know who won? Uh, I think I think it was the uh, Illinois defensive tackle Newton. Oh, Johnny Newton. I yeah, that's they're 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 like this. Two different kinds of players, but <laughs> those two were clearly above everyone else in a in a year that was supposedly gr about great defense in the Big Ten. But I didn't think had a ton of dynamic players except those two guys. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think I think that the more I watched Dejean uh, play, and the more I realized that he was, you know, he he's a he was a pretty big defensive back. He's not a small player. He's he's got some good size to him, I think, isn't he? Six foot and over two hundred pounds, something six like that. One, six one, two oh three. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's some pretty good size. I'm not saying they're the same player, but a, a, some guy, a guy that he reminded me a little bit of in the Big Ten for what he did for his team. Believe it or not, I, he's not as good. Rod Woodson in the Big Ten was, a, I think, a dynamic defensive back and also a lethal return man, I think. Was it at Purdue? I want to say Purdue. But... It, it a lockdown. I, it's a long time ago. Lockdown corner, wasn't he? Yeah, right? yeah he played yeah. corner and safety. I think he hurt. He got hurt in the pros, and then he had to move to safety, but he was he was a really good corner. With the when I compared him to Bob Sanders, Bob was a safety, yeah. so it's a different player because DeGene's a corner. But yeah. uh, I'm just talking about a guy who's always around the ball, and it's, yeah. it's, it's harder to do for a corner. Yeah. Uh, He's just constantly sniffing out ways to not only fulfill yeah. his responsibilities, but but jump off his guy and to get in the mix wherever the ball was. I mean, just a pest. Yeah. 
He a, might be more valuable player. as a safety in the NFL because safety is in the NFL now and being able to cover in the slot and also show up in the run game. I, I wouldn't be surprised. He, he if has he to, play. doesn't he? I mean, uh, he, he, can do whatever. I, he could play any position in the secondary, but I, if you, if you draft him, you put him in wh- however you coordinate your defense, whatever the most important position is, I'd probably just put him there. Yeah. He could be like that blank and ship kid with uh, the Eagles, right? Yeah, Only much more talented. Yeah, Blankenship has a nose for the ball, though, yeah. man. You got to give him credit. He for, does. He does. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, Cooper can cover, I think, quite a bit better. But we'll hopefully that who, that that leg injury isn't too hard for him to bounce back. So, who'd you vote for? Talk. Yeah. Talk so I went about Harrison it. number one. I just always look at it this way. I thought he was the best player in the country, and I thought that I I I thought that he 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 made that. Without him, Penn, I think Penn State's going to win that game. Without without Marvin Harrison, Penn State's probably going to beat Ohio State because. And I think that we're talking about Manny Diaz. I think if Manny had one regret, I think he would have approached covering Marvin a little bit differently in that game because he 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 did he. I don't think he gave the the corners enough help, and he destroyed Penn State secondary. I've never seen one player do that to a Manny Diaz secondary. Yeah, I, if, if, I don't know how you even, how, you, you would have had to play zone and then he would have just sat down in areas and it yeah, wouldn't. But I mean, you could, you could give him help over the top and that could have made the corner a little bit more aggressive, but to put a, a I mean, Marvin had, I think six or seven inches on Kalen King. And you're right. He, he just, there, there had to be a different way though, to try and, if you I don't just, know. I don't know what you do, man. I mean, they they got a rub route and and ran him across the middle on the play yeah. of the game. But I mean, instead, if he just caught six passes for eighty yards and no touchdowns in that game, and so, as opposed to what he did the last two years, he, the last two years at Penn State, those might have been his two two of his three best games at Ohio I State. I don't know how you scheme against him when they can do that. Once he gets a step, it's over. As long yeah. as the ball is placed where it is. Yeah, he can outrun anybody, and I'm telling you, the Michigan game. If McCord has this much more time, Harrison is busting open on a post route because he just needed he needed a quarter of a second, yeah. and that ball is out. Kyle McCord's got a lot of issues, but arm strength is not one of them. Yeah, yeah, he right. was going over the top of that Michigan safety, and it was going to be a touchdown. And everything is different. Everything is different. Because Marvin Harrison is not going to be caught from behind on that play. That is a touchdown. It's a 60-yard touchdown or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, Ohio State is winning the game with a minute to go or less than that. There was 32 seconds or something. They're going to win the game. They were going to win the game 31-30. And then think of the ramifications. (laughs) Kyle McCord's a hero. Uh, Ohio State's in the playoff. Um, Kyle McCord probably doesn't transfer out. Because he, he's he's the the hero. I yeah. mean, it was that close. Because Harrison is such a weapon, man. He is yeah. he is dangerous down there, and Harrison, you can't overthrow him. You yeah. can't overthrow him. I mean, he could have thrown it to the back of the end zone, and he would have gone and got it. Harrison number one, Daniels number two. I went with the Alabama. I thought the Alabama quarterback down the stretch played a lot better. Jalen Milrow. I put I put him three, uh, just because I th- and I think I think in the playoff. If Alabama, if Alabama wins it all, I think he'll be the reason. I really do. If they don't, but I, I just think that he got more comfortable as the year went on, and his talent started to take over, and they were really, really tough to beat. By the way, I talked to Tony Barnhart, who's a really well uh, regarded. He's he's a, an yeah. old <laughs> old dog down there and knows everything about everybody. I mean, he covered Lane Kiffin at North Carolina State. Yeah. He covered Monty Kiffin at North Carolina State. <laughs> I almost got and almost did it again, man. I keep missing. You're good. You're, good. You're being no, consistent. Stop. Yeah, and I'm not, Monty Kiffin was like after, <laughs> after Lou Holtz. Yeah. Right? I mean, this is a long time ago. Tony's seen everything, and he he of course he's covered the SEC his whole life, but he really likes Alabama in that Michigan game. I like him a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. When, when I talked to Tony about it, he was like echoing a lot of the things you were saying almost exactly. Yeah. You would you would have had a blast talking to him about this game. Yeah, I'd be surprised if Michigan wins it. I just think that hey, Michigan's Michigan's really good, but they can only beat you a couple ways. And I That's think right. that I think that they are very very 
I think you can kind of game plan if you have the athletes that you feel can match up with them. I, I, if it becomes a coaching matchup, I think I, I, I do think I think that uh, Alabama's going to be a little bit better, and I, I really think that athletically, I think they're better than Michigan. And I know Michigan's a good team, but I, I just don't know. You know, you, like you said, Ohio State could have easily beat Michigan in Michigan. And I, there's not that a lot was, of yeah, that they was don't not have the same, a lot of different gears at Michigan. I that think was they, not the same game that it has been the last two years at all. Yeah. Um, I think Milrow, uh, the Alabama quarterback, just started playing better. the The chance Michigan has is you know, remember I said this is somebody like Mikey Sanders still um, fools him and makes a pick and runs it back. Michigan's defense has to show up, and I think they can because I don't think Alabama's offense is nearly as overwhelming as it has been with the great receivers, the great running backs, the incredible mm-hmm. offensive line. They are not that this year. Yeah. Uh, so Michigan's defense is going to have to do something, and I think they have the guys to do it. So I'm not saying it's absolute. If i got to pick someone, I'm picking Alabama, but I think Michigan has a better chance to win this game, certainly, than they've done – well, they, they should have beaten TCU, but they weren't going to beat Georgia. It was going to be the same thing as it was two years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so they got lucky getting TCU, and then they couldn't beat them. And we know why. They had dummy singles. <laughs> dummy singles. <laughs> it, I, put love this, I love that. I love that storyline. I know. It's so fantastic. <laughs> it's tremendous. <laughs> it's tremendous. It, I put it this way. I think this is the best chance a Big Ten team has had to match up with a big-time SEC program in a while. Uh, I still don't think Michigan is good, but I think they got a shot. But, man, their defense is going to have to to make some plays for them to win. Don't fall behind. Do not fall behind, J.J. McCarthy. I think it could get get a little nasty. They're not going to be able to gum this game to death winning at scrimmage because they're not going to win. They're not going to have a big win at scrimmage. They're going to do well to just get a draw at scrimmage on both sides of the ball. All right. I'm with you, Dave. I'm with you. All right. Well, that was a pretty quick 35, 36 minutes. We, we covered a lot of ground. Dave, I know you got to get back to feed your dog, so we're going to let you yeah. go. And, I messed uh, up a lot of names. You messed up one. Yeah. Oxnard. We're not go back and edit them. Hey, it happens. It happens. It happens. I'm still trying to get a wrap my head before we go. I'm trying to envision like the the some of the fancier old Miss fans showing up at State College for a playoff game when it's 11 degrees. And trying to have a nice tailgate set up. And, you know, Penn State fans are all around them doing, like, keg stands. I am I am absolutely – you know, I'm, I'm sad I'm not going to see this because I, I, I'm really looking forward to this. I'll just yeah. do it. I'll just do it on my own. Yeah. All right, guys. We'll be back to talk about Penn State real soon. Dave slightly leaning right now towards Ole Miss and Alabama. I'm, I'm, I, am, I think Penn State's going to win, and I really like Alabama a lot. So we'll see. Uh, We could still change our minds.